If we go from these images, which are all light and shimmer, to images that insist and force us to remember farther back into our past, we shall have to take lessons from poets, for how forcefully they prove to us that the houses that were lost forever continue to live on in us, that they insist in us in order to live again, as though they expected us to give them a supplement of living. How much better we shall live in the old house today, how suddenly our memories assume a living possibility of being. We considered the past in a sort of remorse at not having lived profoundly enough in the old house fills our hearts, comes up from the past, overwhelms us. Rilke expresses this poignant regret in unforgettable lines which we painfully make our own, not so much for their expression as for their dramatic depths of feeling. O lowing for places that were not cherished enough in that fleeting hour, how I long to make good from far, the forgotten gesture, the additional act. Why were we so quickly sated with the happiness of living in the old house? Why did we not prolong these fleeting hours? In that reality, something more than reality was lacking. We did not dream enough in that house, and since it must be recaptured by means of daydreams, lesson is hard to Establish, our memories are encumbered with facts beyond the recollections we continually hark back to. We should like to relive our suppressed impressions and the dreams that made us believe in happiness. Where did I lose you, my trampled fantasies? If we have retained an element of dream in our memories, if we have gone beyond merely assembling exact recollections, bit by bit, the house. That was lost in the mist of time will appear from out the shadow. We do nothing to reorganize it. With intimacy, it recovers its entity. In the mellowness and imprecision of the inner life, it is as though something fluid had collected our memories, and we ourselves were dissolved in this fluid of the past. Rilke, who experienced this intimacy of fusion, Speaks of the fusion of being with the lost house. I never saw this strange dwelling again. Indeed, as I see it now, the way it appeared to my child's eye, it is not a building, but it's quite dissolved and distributed inside me. Here one room, there another, and here a bit of corridor, which, however, does not connect the two rooms, but is conserved in me in fragmentary form. Thus the whole thing is scattered about inside me. The rooms, the stairs, that descended with such ceremonious slowness, others, narrow cages that mounted in a spiral movement, in the darkness of which we advance like the blood in our veins. Indeed, at times dreams go back so far into an undefined, dateless past that clear memories of our childhood home appear to be detached from us. Such dreams unsettle our daydreaming, and we. Reached a point where we begin to doubt that we ever lived where we live. Our past is situated elsewhere, and both time and place are impregnated with a sense of our reality. It is as though we sojourn in a limbo of being, and poet and dreamer find themselves writing things upon which metaphysicians would do well to mediate. Here, for instance, is a page of concrete metaphysics which go by overlapping our memory of the childhood house, with daydreams leads us to the ill-defined, vaguely located areas of being, where we are seized with astonishment at being. In a novel half a breath, William Goyen writes that people come into the world in a place they could not at first even name and had never known before. And that out of a nameless and unknown place, they could grow and move around it, until its name they knew and called with love, and called it home, and put roots there and love others there, so that whenever they left this place, they would sing homesick songs about it and write poems of yearning for it, like a lover. The soil in which chance had sown the human plant was of no importance. And against this background of nothingness, human values grow. 
Inversely, if beyond memories we pursue our dreams to their very end, in this pre-memory it is as though nothingness caressed and penetrated being, as though it gently unbound the ties of being. We ask ourselves: Is what has been was? Have facts really the value that memory gives them? Distant memory only recalls them by giving them a value, a halo, a happiness. But let this value be effaced, and the facts cease to exist. Do they ever exist? Something unreal seeps into the reality of the recollections that are on the border line between our own personal history and an indefinite prehistory. In the exact place where, after us, the childhood home comes to life in us, for before us. Goin makes us understand this. It was quite anonymous. It was a place that was lost in the world. Thus, on the threshold of our space, before the era of our own time, we hover between awareness of being and loss of being, and the entire reality of memory becomes spectral. But it would seem that this element of unreality in the dreams of memory affects the dreamer when he. Is faced with the most concrete things, as with the stone house to which he returns at night. His thoughts on mundane things. William Goyen understands this unreality of reality. So this is why, when often as you came home to it, down the road in the midst of rain, it seemed as if the house were founded on the most fragile web of breath that you had down, you had blown it. That you thought it might not exist at all, as built by carpenter's hand, nor had ever, and that it was only an idea of breath breathed out by you, who, with that same breath that had blown it, could blow it all away. In a passage like this, imagination, memory, and perception exchange functions. The image is created through cooperation between real and unreal. With the help of the functions of the real and the unreal, to use the implements of dialectical logic for studying, not this alternative, but this fusion of opposite, would be quite useless, for they would produce the anatomy of a living thing. But if a house is a living value, it must integrate an element of unreality. All values must remain vulnerable, and those that do not are. Dead. When two strange images meet, two images are the work of two poets pursuing separate dreams. They apparently strengthen each other. In fact, the convergence of two exceptional images furnishes, as it were, a countercheck for phenomenological analysis. The image loses its grat gratuitousness. The free play of the imagination ceases to be a form of anarchy. I should like, therefore, to compare Goin's image in a house of breath with one that I quoted in my book, and which, at the time, I was unable to relate to another. Pierre writes, "A house where I go along, calling, a name that silence and a wall gives back to me, a strange house contained in my voice, inhabited by the wind. I invent it. My hand drew draw a cloud." A heaven-bound ship above the forest, mist that scatters and disappears as in the play of images. In order to build better this house in the mist and wind, we sh should need, according to the poet, a more so sonorous voice and a blue incense of heart and word. Like the house of breath, the house of wind and voice is a value that hovers on the frontier. Between reality and unreality, no doubt a realistic mind will remain well the sight of this region. But for the poetry lover who reads with joy and imagination, it is a red letter day when he can hear echoes of the lost house in two registers. The old house, for those who know how to listen, is a sort of geometry of echoes. The voices of the past do not sound the same in the big room as in the little red bedchamber, and calls on the stairs have yet another sound. Among the most difficult memories, well beyond any geometry that can be drawn, we must 
recapture the quality of the light, then calm the sweet smell that linger in the empty room, setting an aerial seal on each room in the house of memory. Still further, it is possible to recover not merely the timbre of the voices, the infections of beloved voices now silent, but also the resonance of each room in the sound house. In this extreme tenuousness of memory, only poets may be expected to furnish us with the document of a subtly psychological nature.